This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, you have found yourself listening to the Human Action Podcast. Today, we're joined in studio by our Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dr. Joe Salerno, and we're talking about praxeology, the method of economics, or at least the Austrian method of economics. And Joe, it's great to see you. Thank you. Good to see you, Jeff, and thank you for having me on. Well, I want to I want to start with a couple of overarching thoughts for you. First and foremost is that in many ways, maybe praxeology and method are the most controversial elements of, of Austrianism or Misesian economics. And second, there seems to be this innate human desire to look at things, uh, systems, branches of thought, and, and want to pick and choose like a buffet. Uh, in, in other words, perhaps you don't want to choose praxeology in the whole of, of Austrian economics. So start start with that. Is this, is this the most controversial uh, branch of Misesian thought? Uh, yeah, yes, I think it, it definitely is. Um, uh, although Mises himself has written on it in, in numerous works, uh, beginning in 1928, um, a book came out, Epistemological Problems, which uh, embodied his essays from 28 to 33. Uh, and then in Human Action, he went through and, and uh, developed it more, even more systematically. And then he went back to it again in 1956 in his last great treatise, Theory and History, and, uh, and then had some final thoughts, uh, very deep thoughts, and very important thoughts on it in his Ultimate Foundation of Economic Science in 1962, which was his last real book. So uh, for Mises, it wasn't controversial. Um, Mises saw what he was doing in, in, uh, the, in developing the method of economics as simply extending what uh, economists, for the most part, had been doing up through the 1930s, uh, including the classical economists, such as Nassau Sr. and J.B. Say. Um, they all were operating in, in a deductive manner. Um, and ultimately, although they didn't know it, it was based on human action. So it's, it's controversial maybe today in yeah. the 21st century. Yes. I mean, I think the controversy started in the 1930s um, when mathematical economics began to come in, uh, at least in the English-speaking world, and um, when we also had positivism. Uh, de which, which developed earlier in Germany, but then um, developing and, and, transport and transferred to, to the English-speaking world. But it's so interesting that the positivists and the empiricists of today know so little about the history of economic thought. It's almost like they just assume, well, everyone knows that this is the method of economics, and they, they, do, they simply don't know what economics was 100 years ago or 150 years yeah, ago. Yes, and uh, part of the problem with that, uh, the, the reason for that, is that all history of, of, of economic thought courses – uh, have, have long disappeared in, in graduate programs. Um, they started being phased out in the late 60s as mathematical economics began coming in and the model of physics began coming in so that you, you never really had to read, you know, um, Galilei or, or, or any of these other earlier um, natural scientists. So uh, the um, economists and uh, the heads of economic progr economics programs began to ape physics in that, in that respect dismissing prior thought. So you've written a lot about the history of Austrian economics, the sociology of Austrian economics. And one thing you mentioned in a particular essay is that praxeology uh, or, or an understanding of and at least a, a tacit approval of this approach is at the heart of what it means to be an Austrian. In other words, just some, some vague subjectivism or methodological individualism is not sufficient that in order to be an Austrian, one has to be a praxeologist. So can you explain this? Yes. Yeah, so I'm, I wasn't so much saying that you had to be conversant with uh, you know, the, the, the methodology in the sense that you, you needed to be someone who could advance the methodology. What I meant by that was that you had to be fully um, comfortable using the method of the praxeological method to actually develop economic theory if you w wish to work in the area of theory rather than, let's say, applying it, Austrian theory. So um, that, that was all I meant by that. And, and you can see it in, in Mises and, and especially Rothbard. They con in, in their economics proper, their economic theory, um, uh, for example, in Man, Economy, and State, Rothbard doesn't write a lot about praxeology in that book, but he uses the method to develop from human action the, the theoretical deductions that um, make up the body of, of economic science. 
So to you, uh, the essence of Austrian economics, let's just say, is, is economic theorems arrived at through this process of praxeological deduction. And that's at the heart of what we think of as Austrian economics. Yeah, that, that's the core of Austrian economics. It allows us to find in the social world the laws of cause and effect. Um, Karl Menger, who was a, a proto-praxeologist and the founder of the Austrian school, um, the first few lines of his, of his great work on principles was that all, uh, uh, all phenomena are subject to the law of, of cause and effect. And uh, that's how we get ca cause and effect in, in, into economics. And I'll talk more about that in, in a little while as we go on. But when we use the term method... Do we mean the, the method of learning economic science, the method of applying it? Is it a research method? And what, what do, how do we use the term method? Yeah, it's a research method in today's language in, in, in the sense that uh, you, you need a, a number of axioms, starting with the uh, human action axiom, that people consciously apply means to achieve ends, which is arrived at really introspectively. We all look inside ourselves, and we treat other people as if that were true. Uh, even natural science because they have to have repeatability of experiments in order to establish scientific laws, treat others, other scientists who are repeating these experiments as, as, as human beings with means and ends and costs and benefits and, 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 and so on. So uh, this is um, the, the, the core of, of, of praxeology. So we were speaking off mic earlier and, and you mentioned that Mises had already been an economist for, for many decades, had already written a couple of substantive books before he ever developed fully his theory of the proper method for economics, which he lays out at, at length at, at, towards the beginning of human action. So, so talk about all this. He thought it was important to be an economist for a while before you started talking about how to be an economist. Yeah, that, that's, ex that's exactly true. He had already written two great treatises, um, uh, Theory of Money and Credit and Socialism, before he put pen to paper to write about methodology, which he began writing essays in 1928, and by 1933 he had written a number of essays on methodology proper, um, and by then he was a middle-aged uh, economist who had done a lot of, of original work in economics itself, and that the fruits of those efforts were the epistemological problems of, of economic science, which he then developed even further uh, in 1940 in, in the German language edition of Human Action and then 49 in the English language edition. Uh, and very strikingly, what Mises um, pointed out was that one really must be a scientist to cogitate and think about and write about the issues of method. You have to be a scientist first. So, uh, for example, he, he compares Galilei, or Galileo, the first name, um, to uh, 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 Francis Bacon and says that really the, 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 the person who most advanced science, the scientific method in the natural sciences was Galilei, not, not Bacon. And he says the same thing about, about, about Newton and, uh, versus Kant, that, that it wasn't the epistemolo epistemologist Kant that really furthered the method, but, but, but it, was, it was Newton in, who actually did the science. So um, if we look, at, things began to ch change in Austrian economics in the 1970s and 80s, um, there was a lot of interest in praxeology, uh, and rightfully so. Um, the Austrian revival was well underway, and Hayek had done, done work in, in, prax in, in, in praxeological type methodology and had won the Nobel Prize. And we, and we began to see very young people, graduate students, tr trying to write on these things. Uh, for example, um, I, I won't name names to protect the, the guilty, but there were three graduate students at George Mason in the early 1980s who hadn't written anything substantive in economics, and they, they, wrote, they wrote a paper dismissing equilibrium as, 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 as useless for developing economic science. Uh, there was also another paper by a graduate student and, and, and a young professor at, at, at George Mason uh, who, uh, in which uh, the, they dismissed the use of the ERE in economics. Now, these people hadn't done any science. They, hadn't, they weren't the Newtons. They weren't the Galileos. Okay? They, they, they were just people speculating about these things. And the, the ERE is the evenly rotating economy, yes, which is, is sort of a, an heuristic uh, tool. In, in it's, a, it's, it's an equilibrium tool that the Austrians um, use, and it's much more it's, – it's better specified than the normal equilibrium uh, – mathematical equilibrium, at least better specified for the purposes of, of Austrian research.
But as a lay person, it would seem to be that method, of course, is going to affect everything. Method is going to affect even conclusions. Um, so if you don't get method right, you're arriving at a very different science. You're you're on a completely different track. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, so that is why I think it's important to begin to do science based on the science that your mentors have done and to try to develop their, their the body of thought that they've handed down. And in our case, it's Mises and that's Rothbard and Kirzner uh, and, and, of course, Hayek. But, but um, if methodological problems crop up, it, they should crop up and be addressed during the course of your research. In other words, your research, if there are any holes in, 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 in the um, praxeological method, it will be revealed by doing real research. And that's what Mises found, that, that Bombavark and Menger, his teachers, had actually not thought all, all the way through uh, certain problems in economics, which were me methodological. And that's when he began to develop methodology further than they had, or even the classical economists had. So by the 1940s, when Mises has more fully developed his concept of praxeology, he opens Human Action Part 1. Uh, and right away in, in Chapter 2, he, he spends 100-odd pages on what he calls the epistemological problems of the sciences of human action. So this is, this is right at the beginning, at the core of his, of his most important book. Yes, I, I think what he's doing there is um, not saying that you need to, to put methodology f first, but, but he, what he's doing there is um, he's condensing and, and, and just setting out the method that, that he, he perfected, but that had been the method of economics from the classical school all the way up until the 1930s. And so in, in, in effect, he's, he's, he's filling in what was left out of, of economic treatises proper. So even though his then goes on to be a, a treatise on economic theory, um, he, he, he puts that first. Now, Rothbard, since Mises already set that out, in Man, Economy, and State, you don't see methodology being put first. You, you, you see the, the method being used, and, and uh, very successfully, I might add, uh, in, in developing the whole architectonic, which is the whole structure of, of economic theory. So when Mises goes on about the action axiom, first of all, give us a summary of what that is. And second of all, do you think he saw that as a codification, something he reluctantly had to point out that, that ought to have been a baseline for economics? Or do you think he, he viewed that as a correction to the, to the current vogue of the time? Yeah, when, I think when, when Mises you know, spoke about the so-called um, – well, he never used the term action axiom. I think that was Rothbard's term. But, 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 but the, the, um, the basic law of human action, the basic, or what he would call a category of human action, because he thought it was a category of the human mind, which we'll talk about. But um, when, when Mises did that, I think, uh, first of all, what he meant, he meant, he simply meant that people act not rationally necessarily. I mean, a drug addict who is conscious and, and is acting to obtain drugs and, and, and to get high um, is acting in, in a way that everyone else acts. And what is that with purpose, acting purposively? And then, and then Mises used analysis to analyze that a little further. It means that you're using means, okay, the paraphernalia, the, the money you use to buy the, the drugs and so on, to achieve your ends, that is, to get high. Whether or not those ends are responsible, moral, um, self-destructive, is beside the point for the economist, okay? It's purposeful. Uh, it may be even irrational. From, from an ethical point of view, there is, I believe, uh, a rationality in ethics. Um, but that, that's, not, that, that's not what we mean by, by um, the, the, the action axiom. Any action uh, by a conscious actor is, is, can be explained by, by this action axiom. I think there's a lot of implications that immediately follow. But a lot of his critics, including critics at the time when the book came out, would say this is pretty thin. I mean, everyone knows that humans act. And how did economics get to a state by the 1940s where this had to be uh, reasserted as a starting point? Well, part of it was, was, um, uh, was mathematical economics, um, uh, which came into vogue in the early 1930s. Um, it was transferred from, from France and, and Italy and Switzerland uh, by, uh, via Valras and Pareto, and then, and then the, the people who adapted it uh, in, uh, to... Um, and by the way, it was interesting. Hayek really brought Pareto to the attention of English-speaking economists when he, he came to the London School of Economics. 
So I mentioned earlier that that method brings up a lot of other topics, and Mises goes through a lot of concepts in this section on epistemological mm-hmm. problems, like individualism and reason, and polylogism and time, uh, you know, uncertainty about the future, value scales, marginal utility, uh, cooperation. All of these things are flowing from that axiom, and so we're, we're we're really getting a mini course in economics in just this first section of the book. Yeah, and also in logic. I mean, uh, so what Mises points out is that once once you introduce means and ends, it means, and people aiming at ends, it means that they're not perfectly satisfied, logically. And if you're not perfectly satisfied, that means that there's scarcity in the world. There's scarcity of means, the things that will be used by you to bring about satisfaction. And once that is admitted, um, there's the phenomena of co- a phenomenon of cause and effect, that people, if they really want to achieve ends, they have to know what what particular phenomenon brings about another particular phenomenon, and that's the, 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 the law of cause and effect. Uh, and time preference, the fact that people are acting now, that people are, are trying to bring these ends into the present or, or as close as possible to themselves by acting today rather than tomorrow brings in the law of time preference. And then the fact that means are, 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 are scarce means that people have to choose between what ends many of which would satisfy them, but only a few of which they can attain because the means are scarce, what ends to choose? And that brings in value scale. So you can see Mises logically uh, infers from this lone concept of, of purposeful action all of these other basic concepts of economics. So that means praxeology is obviously a cousin of logic here. Yes. and. What strikes me, though, is if you read the beginning of his book, the first again, the first 100-odd pages, think of how different all this is from the first 100-odd pages of a typical micro course in, in a textbook in, in a college freshman today. I mean, this, this, is, this is a different science. Yeah, it's totally different. Uh, in, in the textbook that you would look at uh, or that you would teach from uh, as a professor today, um, you would almost immediately introduce the student to models, uh, at models w- which have some independent variables uh, and some dependent variables. So you introduce them to the model of supply and demand um, in which the you know, supply uh, and, and the demand are, are independent variables and, and, then, and then the price is, is the dependent variable. So you squeeze human action out of it. Um, they, of course, I mean, it's a mixed bag because uh, they do, in fact, introduce scarcity and they, they do, do in, introduce opportunity cost. So they have learned some of the lessons from the, uh, the uh, classical and Austrian economists. All right, but we shouldn't kid ourselves. Uh, for example, Noah Smith, Noah Opinion, the famous Twitterer mm-hmm. uh, who writes for Bloomberg, was just writing something the other day about how, you know, hearkening back to this uh, attack on Mises as a literary economist, that they, there, there are plenty of people today who think that uh, economics ought to be written literally in formulas, that it, it ought not to consist of text and words, that, that um, in other words, uh, Mises' uh, view of all this is it didn't hold, and it's, it's not um, what, what resonates today. Yeah, well, uh, once again, w- once mathematics was introduced and once economics en- began to envy physics and see itself not as a what used to be called a moral science or a, a science of, of human beings, but a, a science of quantitative phenomena like prices, okay? Um, and uh, th- at that point, it, it was, it's very hard to, to, to separate, to disentangle the, 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 math, the, math, the math from, from the, meaning, the meaning of words. Yeah, no, it's absolutely true. And again, in this same section, Mises takes pains to distinguish uh, social sciences from physical sciences. I mean, he he writes at some length about the difference. Mm-hmm. And, and and so, in other words, even in the 1940s, he felt that it was necessary to distinguish strongly between the two. So there was already a problem. Yeah, oh, no, yes, he thought there was. And, and what, what, he, what he pointed out was that uh, in social science, that er, any... Any quantitative um, variables, a, 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 a price, for example, is an event. It's a complex event, like World War I. In other words, there were different people in, at, at a certain date that had different values, and they came together in something called the market, and um, they interacted and exchanged, and that 
pr a price emerge from that on that date among these different people. That is completely different than the price for the same product that would um, uh, uh, emerge the next day because there are different people, their volitions have changed, their value scales have changed. And so, so Mises pointed out that these are, even though they look the same, the quantities of money that are exchanged for um, per unit of a good, uh, that they're, they're different from one another because they're heterogeneous events. So that was the key. There were no homogeneous events in, in the social sciences that you could measure, that you could find constant relationships between, and so on. Yeah, he says here uh, it, it, at page 39 of the Scholar's Edition, a lot of you have that, he says, the sciences of human action differ radically from the natural sciences. All authors eager to construct an epistemological system of the science of human action according to the pattern of natural sciences err lamentably. So he wasn't pulling any punches here. But, but again, I think most people today think of science as uh, something where you create a hypothesis and you test it and you revise it, and they don't distinguish between uh, natural and and human sciences. Yeah, that's the criterion of falsifiability. I mean, you can come up with these tentative scientific laws, um, uh, but yet they're 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 subject to change uh, if 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 there's they're falsified in in the future and uh, new new uh, broader laws possibly that cover more phenomena are then are then developed. Um, you know, as a result of some tests that these laws did not stand up to. And of course, this is a common criticism of Austrians, right? Is that if something's not, if a proposition, let's say, or is not falsifiable, then it's some sort of dogma. But, but, it, but even that statement in itself uh, is contradictory because if it's, it, it, is it falsifiable? Yeah, no, the, the, uh, yeah, right. To say that, that um, anything that is not falsifiable is not science or that you can't arrive at any knowledge Without, without developing falsifiable statements is itself a non-falsifiable statement. So um, it's, it's, it's sort of the boomerang principle. It comes back at the, at, at the person who proposes it and, and, and destroys the proposition. Uh, and, and we all know, uh, uh, again, in order to have natural science and to develop the idea of falsifiability or, or, or verifiability, you have to have human minds interacting. You have to have human minds that can carry out exp repeat experiments. Uh, and, and also, Mises very importantly points out, this is something that's important, that um, if you want to have natural science, before you can even have it, you have to have in your mind, the, uh, which is, this is non-falsifiable, the idea that there's cause and effect. That if you bring A and B together, then there'll be a regularity and a succession of events that will, will bring about C. And this will always occur. Now, where did we arrive at that law of, 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 of cause and effect and, and, and the idea of regularity? Well, Mises says it's a law of thought. It's a category that's already in the human mind. He, he follows Kant. Rothbard uses a different vocabulary. He's more, he's more of a, a Thomistic philosopher. Uh, Rothbard says, no, it's a law of reality. The mind is, cre is created or, or the mind develops in such a way um, that it is able to, 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 to um, learn about uh, and use these, the law of cause and effect, which, it's, which it observes in reality. But in any case, the vocabulary is a little bit different between the two, mm -hmm. but, but you see that without cause and effect and regularity and a number of other things um, that are, pro and this is where the a priori comes in, that's that are, that are prior to experience, you really couldn't even have natural science, let alone um, the science of economics. But if we don't have prior thought or prior understanding or knowledge, and, and if we don't have any theory, then what would words be, what would data and, and empirical knowledge be uh, in the form of words to an illiterate or in the form of yeah. numbers to an enumerate person? In other words, we have to, it, I, I'm sure physical scientists would agree that we have to filter all of this through something. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, Mises me, me pointed out that um, without the, the law of cause and effect, accumulating data would mean absolutely nothing. If we didn't have this prior idea that, that, that certain things are going to regularly follow other things um, now and in the future, then, then just accumulating data means absolutely nothing. It's meaningless. So I think that's, that's a very important insight. That used to be called the philosophy of nature, which was prior to to, um, to 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 physical sciences. In other words, there had to be a philosophy of of nature, and 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 this is a Thomistic discipline, and it yields you these insights. For example, that look, there's no real silver in the world. There's only pieces of things 
that all have similar properties in the sense of, of cause and effect and of, of what they're composed of. And then we come up with the idea of, of, of silver. It's a category. So you have to have the, the difference between the individual and the species already in mind before you can do science. There's so many things that are wrong with, with the positivist approach to, to even natural sciences. Well, so he develops this more fully uh, as he gets into later life. And as you mentioned, in the 1950s, he produced his theory and history. And then in the early 60s, really his last full length book, yes. uh, The Ultimate Foundation of Economic Science. We're going to link to that. You can read it for free, by the way, online. Um, so, so talk about his further development in theory and history, and then let's talk about the ultimate foundation of economic yeah, I, science. Yeah, I think the most important, I mean, uh, the, the th book Theory and History uh, has been called by, by Rothbard one of Mises' um, neglected, greatly neglected works. And it, it, it's a treatise, and it's a treatise on the difference between the method of history and the method of a prioristic human sciences like economics. And, and, and Mises pointed out that the difference was that in history, we're no longer dealing with just formal means and ends and costs. We're no longer dealing with just the structure of action that any human being um, uh, uh, demonstrates. Um, what we're dealing with are concrete means and concrete ends. So we have to have something called understanding. And so he developed a discipline called phimology, which is really literary psychology. So, for example, um, this can give you information about the future. I mean, uh, thymology can give you information about people's future reactions. Uh, for example, I am fully confident that when I go home today, um, my, the furniture in my home will not all be gone and my wife will have disappeared. Okay? I'm, I'm confident of that because I know her, what means call her character based on contact with her, uh, based on my knowing her value scales or, or knowing parts of her value scales. I know that she won't act in that manner. Well, that can be a, the entrepreneur uses the same thing to apply to consumers in the, in the future today and in the future. No one thinks that by next year, soccer or European football in the United States will replace American football as the most um, uh, popular sport, and, and and no entrepreneur would bank on that. So these are the types of insights. It's a brilliant book. Uh, these are the types of insights that, that thymology can yield you and, and, and why it's used both by the historian to look backwards and find out why Caesar, for example, did cross the Rubicon um, uh, and by entrepreneurs to find out why, for example, people um, before cell phones were, were, were there, why people would want cell phones. Yeah, and you mentioned it's, it's a bit of a lost book. Yes. And you called it a treatise. So yeah. what, why do you think that is? Was Mises unhappy with the reception of the book? I, yeah, well, uh, it, it was not really read. Now, I can, from my own experience, I remember in uh, the, um, uh, at the inception of what we called the Austrian Revival in 1974 when a number of economists got together to hear the, the, great Aust the three great Austrians at the time, Murray Rothbard, Israel Kurzer, and uh, Ludwig Lachmann speaking at, in, in Vermont. Um, at a seven-day conference, uh, that book wasn't discussed much. Everyone was talking about human action, uh, about theory of money and credit, um, socialism. But the, the, the book was just never, um, and I think I, I know the reason for this, but, but, but it, was, it was, no one really read it as deeply and, 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 and was as interested in it. And I think the reason why was because it was really on the method of history. And, and the, though there was some, you know, some economics in it or, or, or references to the, the method of economics. But so people, since, since the Austrian revival was mainly among economists, I, I think, you know, they weren't as quite as interested in history. So by the time he publishes The Ultimate Foundation of Economic Science, he's really, in, in a lot of ways, doubling down mm -hmm. on what he put forth in human action and also on what some of his critics have been said, uh, have said. And you can, you can find this right off the bat on page three. He says that who he wants to achieve anything in praxeology must be conversant with mathematics, physics, biology, history, and jurisprudence, da, da, da. So he's talking about these other branches of knowledge as, as being important. But he says, once again, economics has been led astray by the vain idea that economics must proceed according to the pattern of the other sciences. So he's not mellowing on this later in his career. Not at all. So uh, talk about that. First of all, a address where he talks about praxeology. A praxeologist has to be conversant with all these other uh, sciences. Well, yeah, th those are cognate sciences. I mean, we, we, have, to, we have to know 
um, mathematics. We have we have to know logic in particular um, because because praxeology is the logic of action. Um, history give, just gives us an idea of of the types of things that are important for praxeology to address. In other words, look in history. Um, you don't see a lot of instances of barter. So history is useful for showing us that really the, what we should be focusing on is the history of the, or, or the theory of the monetary economy. Um, history doesn't show us a lot of examples of, 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 co of cooperatives, a, a co cooperative economy or a household economy. It, it, but it does show us that, that more, the market economy is, is important. So uh, praxeology takes its cue from history in that respect in, in, in deciding what phenomena to investigate praxeologically. So do you think we should take this book as his fullest and final exposition of, of praxeology? Should we accord it more weight because it's later in life, later in his career? No, I, I think the, the fullest uh, exposition of praxeology comes in human action. But this book should be read in, in, in conjunction with human action and actually in, in conjunction with theory and history because what it does is he doubles down in his cri criticism of positivism. Uh, so this book is really a critique of positivism and uh, there's a very nice introduction by Israel Kirzner that, um, to the book that, that points this out. And, and, and it's in this book, and it's a very short book in which Mises ties epistemology and method to human freedom. I mean, he, he, he goes through the steps to show that if you choose the wrong method, you're going to, your science is going to be all screwed up. You're going to be really turning into a social engineer uh, because people who reject these, these laws of cause and effect in the air, sphere of human action are inevitably people who want to formulate new utopias. So um, it, it, it's, it's a great book. It, it's very difficult to describe it and, it, and it seems to be sort of disjointed, as you had mentioned off air before, but it, it's really not. Um, there, there's an overarching uh, theme, and the theme is in order to have human freedom, you have to be uh, conversant with the correct methodology of the social sciences, and you have to admit that the social sciences have an autonomous existence apart from the physical sciences. Well, he does tie it together with politics. For example, he talks about the cult of science and managed socialism and how, in other words, how bad method leads to bad policy. Yeah. And, and he, he do, sort of reiterates some of his points here from socialism. Um, Devil's Advocate question, you, as you mentioned, it's a thin book, uh, very readable for a lay person. If, if a, a lay listener is not going to read theory and history and perhaps has not yet tackled or may never tackle human action. Uh, is this a, a reasonable one-off substitute for understanding praxeology? Uh, I, I think I, I would have to say yes and no. Yes, in the sense that you, you, you get a sense of what he's talking about and, 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 he sh and, and you see the connection between method and, and freedom. But if you want to do economics and want to understand Austrian economics, you really do have to read his more, more substantial works okay, on, on well, methodology. I'm going to go out on a limb and say if you read the ultimate foundation of economic science on our site. You will know more about praxeology than, than most of your neighbors. That's how, how, how's that? I'm, I'm, I'm there. That's yeah. right. Well, the other thing that I want to mention about this book is he has a, a short but devastating little critique of macro in, in this book. And he talks about, he, he attacks the, the, the different method of macroeconomics, this, this, this uh, uh, fetish for, uh, for aggregates. Yeah. So what, what Mises is saying is that um, macroeconomics seeks to come to conclusions about what kind of policy works to stop inflation or to prevent recessions uh, by focusing on uh, these, these what we might call macroeconomic aggregates in, in a sense of total investment in the economy, total spending in the economy or what's called aggregate demand. And these are these aggregates that are bumping against one another, um, causing certain effects. Uh, but as Mises points out, these aggregates are composed of, of, of actions of, of, of individuals. And to understand the movements of the aggregates, to even, to even know if the aggregates make any sense, because some of them don't even make any sense. For example, total GDP doesn't make any sense. You're, you're trying to add up apples and oranges, literally. Apples, oranges, tablet computers, uh, cars, and so on. Um, in order to know if that makes any sense, the, what aggregates do and don't make sense, you, you need, you need to, to focus on methodological individualism. That is, focus on, on individual action and then their interaction in the market. Then the aggregates fall out of that. Okay, they don't, it's the market that drives things. 
and, and individual choices that drives things. And, 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 and the aggregates are sort of just the outcome. So in that sense, focusing on things like GDP is putting the cart before the horse. Uh, by all means. I mean, in fact, GDP is um, – or t- total spending, by the way, which um, is used today uh, to um, talk about how we should run monetary policy by um, f- targeting a nominal GDP figure or uh, targeting total spending in the economy um, is, is, is something that is, is wrong because – it's really – spending doesn't drive prices. Spending doesn't cause prices to go up or down. It's the other way around, okay? People value different things versus money. And when money prices are arrived at, then the spending occurs. But the spending occurs afterward. It's an outcome. It doesn't cause – spending doesn't cause anything to happen. Well, I want to talk also about Murray Rothbard's defense or explication of a priori uh, a methodology in economics. And as you mentioned earlier, although praxeology infuses man economy and state, he doesn't really discuss it per se right. at length in that book. Um, he did happily have an article called In Defense of Extreme A Prioriism. It's not too long. We will link to it. And, and let's start with what you mentioned earlier, which was that Rothbard leaned more heavily on Aristotle and Aquinas to, un- to in his understanding of a prioriisms, whereas Mises uh, leaned on Kant. So d- discuss the difference a little bit here. Yeah. So as I, I think I mentioned before, um, for Rothbard, the um – Things like the uh, the what he called the action axiom, and marginal utility, and 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 these various other categories that we use in in developing economic science, they were laws of reality. That is, uh, he, he believed that the human mind is capable of grasping reality, and 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 part of reality is is action of human beings. So the, the, the human mind uh, can grasp this idea of cause and effect. Can re, you know th- through experiencing the real world now not through history but just through general experience. So th- there's a few axioms that are are self evident to the human mind. That that, that was Rothbard's um, point. Uh, that they were not def- they were not necessarily innate in the human mind. They 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 didn't they didn't compose the human mind, but but they were they were learned by the human mind. Whereas you know Kant and and Mises Kantian approach made you think that they were sort of categories or, or, or built into the human mind. Uh, but ultimately, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, it, it, as I said before, it's a difference in vocabulary, not in meaning. As you mentioned, this is almost a distinction without a difference. So Rothbard brings it up thus. He says, well, we experience things, we observe them through our senses. And as a result, there's kind of a sliver of, an, of empiricism inherent in that. Uh, you know, I, in fact, uh, look, Ro- it's, it's empirical, not in a positivist sense, but in the common sense sense. That is that, that to say that, for example, human beings prefer leisure to labor mm-hmm. or, or, or to say that there's a variety of natural resources and different uh, in the world as well as, as different skills among the, the, the population, those are, are self-evident and they can be used in building up economic theory, and they are used in building up praxeological economic theory. These are these are are, are, are insights that are broadly empirical. Even the action axiom that people use means to achieve ends um, is empirical in the sense that look, our minds exist in the world of reality, and we are looking inward. We're in, through introspection, we come up with the means and ends, but 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 also by dealing with other people in our everyday interactions we can see that we treat them as if they do use means to achieve ends. That's how we get them to do what we want. We, 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 uh, when we exchange with someone, we're giving them means in our minds that are more valuable to them than what, what, than what, what, what they're going to cede over to us in the exchange. Well, Joe, what I love about this article, in just maybe 10 short pages, he really helps us understand Mises and and all of what we've been talking about up till now in in this conversation. And he actually lays out a definition, sort of a four-part test, a definition of of, of a praxeologist. So let's just run through this real quick and get your your thoughts on it. First of all, it's someone who understands axioms and premises that are absolutely true, and that the theorems and conclusions deduced from those axioms are therefore absolutely true, and that there's not only no need for empirical testing, but then in fact, you can't test these things. Right. And so he gives us this nice, neat understanding of what praxeology means. Right. I mean, you can't, you can't test these things because, they're, because the, 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 the um, theorems 
are couched in terms of of things that are complex events. To talk about what a recession is like talking about World War II. So when you talk about a recession, you're talking about a specific event. You cannot look at all recessions and look at the statistics related to all these recessions and come up with the theory of recessions. Because historically, they all are different from one another. However, using praxeology, we can see the, the, the pattern or the sequence of cause and effect in the data themselves. So Austrians are not against collecting data, are not against observing, considering data, um, and even getting hints about what they should, how they should develop their theory from data. But what, uh, what, what they're against is using data directly to come up with these regularities that, that might be called theories. Right, and oftentimes the attack is that we we advocate extreme a prioriism, right. which is to say blind or somehow uh, not falsifiable, or that we're ignoring data and empiricism. But in in in, a, in the sense that you're saying it, data or em, empirical knowledge can help us reexamine the underlying theory, and and right. Yeah, yeah. Um, for for example, in my own work. Um, um, when I was considering writing an article on the um, financial crisis, uh, which I did did finally write, um, it, it struck me that cons- there was a consumption boom during the um, the run up to to the financial crisis, as well as an investment boom. And the Austrian theory really focuses on the investment boom. And some people have attacked uh, attacked the Austrian theory, both Austrians and, and non Austrians, like. Uh, Krugman and, and Brad DeLong, these are, are mainstream macroeconomists, they said, well, why is there a consumption boom if, if, people are, you know, if, if people are being misled by a low interest rate? Well, there's a consumption boom because of the inflation that causes prices to, of, of assets to increase. So that was the, the data that, sh- that, that showed that there was you know, this, this big retail boom that occurred. Um, led me to think through the Austrian theory and, 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 and to, 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 to develop it deductively. And that is that there is a wealth effect. It's called, I, I call it a false wealth effect. The Keynesians call it a wealth effect. That is that when people's price of their houses go up, their 401ks go up in value, they begin using their houses as an ATM machine. Okay? And that is completely consistent with, with the Austrian theory. And I developed the Austrian theory in that direction, the Austrian theory of the business cycle, that is. So, yeah, I mean, you, you have to know the data. You have to get your, get your hands dirty. But isn't it interesting how there's sort of this presumption in favor of data uber alles today? And, and nobody ever questions whether data can be wrong. We always say, well, here's the data. So if it doesn't match the theory, then the theory must be wrong. But, but as we all know, data collection, sample right. size, everything about it is just fraught with, with problems. It's, it's just riddled with problems, now, in, including who funds the study. It, from there on down, the, the, the foibles of the researchers themselves, right. the limitations of our knowledge, the collection methods. I mean, the idea that somehow the data are conclusive and then we have to reverse engineer the theory from that, I think, ignores all of this. Yeah, that's very... That's a very good point. Um, there's a great book by um, an Austrian, Oscar Morgenstern, who was a, a student of Mises. He later, I mean, he didn't agree with Mises on everything, um, but he wrote a book called, uh, I believe it's called On Economic Observations, in which he pointed out the problems with just the, the, the data themselves. So, you know, as Rothbard goes further along in this article, he starts with the one main action axiom, with his term again, as, as you pointed out earlier. And from that, he drives some postulates uh, and these are self-evident, broad, not falsifiable. Right. But I think when he uses the term broad, he's getting back to this distinction of how we how we uh, theorize these things, whether it's sort of through empirical observation or whether it's just something that that's so fundamental to human nature that we all understand it. So so talk talk about the postulates and what they mean for our so, understanding. So he, he says that you need something beyond the simple action axiom. Um, uh, you know, you, you don't want to, to, to develop a praxe. Mises said you can do this, uh, uh, but it would be wrong. Develop a praxeology of all conceivable worlds. You don't want to do that. You want to root the praxeology in premises that are true of our world. And so some of the premises that are true are, are the broadly empirical premises that consumers, uh, that, that people um, or consumers favor or value leisure above, above labor, that, that that's a valuable consumer's good. Um, that there's a, a diversity in natural resources and human skills, that, um, that we have a money economy, and, uh, which is broadly empirical, and that um, firms maximize profit for the most part. 
So, so those are four broadly empirical postulates, that he, and there are others also that, that, that you introduce into the chain of praxeological reasoning as you go along and as you want to apply to certain areas that are of interest to the economist. So Mises was against developing praxeology as mental, gym, he called it mental gymnastics. He said you could develop praxeology for a race of immortal beings. Um, he says you could develop praxeology, he says somewhere, that you could develop for a, a race of beings that could not understand written symbols. But we don't want to do that. I mean, uh, we, we want to develop for the conditions of action that are part of our world. But again, just from the idea that humans act, we can derive these four postulates, for example, the division of labor, leisure, indirect exchange, firms maximizing profit. Without any data, without em any empirical work, we, we can logically deduce Well, well he's, he's not saying you deduce it from, from the action. He says, in addition to the action act, you look around and you see the world in which people act. So they act in a world of money. They act in a world where there's firms that, that maximize profits, where there is differences in skills. You could develop a praxeology of a world where there's, there's no differences in labor skills. Mm -hmm. So he's saying you, you have to... Um, uh, hedge it about by, by, true, by true empirical postulates. But they're empirical in the sense that anyone who cares to look can, can find them. They're not self-evident in the same sense that the human action axiom is self-evident. But they derive from it. Yes. So another thing, uh, like Mises, Rothbard takes pains here to talk about what rational action means yes. uh, versus uh, purposeful or, or means ends. And so you brought up the, the idea of a, of a junkie earlier. Um, and we could say, well, that's irrational that you go out and seek to score some more heroin. You're destroying your life. You're ruining your health. You're hurting your family, whatever yeah, it might yeah. be. But I, I, we get into almost a semantic distinction here because purposeful is purposeful rational. In other words, in the junkie's mind, it is perfectly rational to go score in some yes. bad part of town at a crack house. Um, but but and it it. it advances objectives in a means ends type of right analysis. it does yes it, um, it absolutely does so how should we think of the term rational as it applies here well i mean when people say that um it's it's irrational for somebody to um uh commit suicide let's take an extreme example uh well i mean in the praxeological sense do they 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 try to commit suicide by taking a banana and hitting themselves over the head with a banana or do they, they do it by using a, a fire, firearms or using pills? It's rational in that sense. It's rational in the sense that they're adapting the means that they know of to the ends that they want to achieve. That's all we mean by, uh, well, that's all we mean by pur pur purposeful, okay? So if you want to use, that's why Rothbard, more than Mises, was against using the word rational in that sense or using it as a synonym for, for purposeful. He thought rational should, should be in the sense that you used it uh, it was more of an ethical sense mm -hmm. to, 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 for the end, to denote the ends, whether the ends themselves are rational. But the means are always rational given the person's knowledge, okay? If a person really believed that hitting himself in the head with a banana would, would, would um, you know, achieve his end, well, then, that's, then that would be purposeful. Okay, Joe, as we wrap up, I want to talk about some other people who have contributed right. to the Austrian conception of method. For example, Hans-Hermann Hoppe has a book called Economic Science and the Austrian Method, which we'll link to. We have available in both audio and print formats. Uh, give us your view of the sort of the current state of the debate or the discussion within Austrian or Austrian uh, close circles about method. Is, is anybody writing on it, researching in it? Is it in flux? Um, I think at least the people and economists and, and philosophers associated with the Mises Institute are, are pretty settled in the sense that they, they think that Mises and Rothbard have, have at least articulated the correct method and have used it correctly and, and now are, more, are concentrating more on, on using it to develop economics and, and to apply economics and, and, to, and, and to address questions using the praxeological method that or of interest to the mainstream. That's where we're at now. Um, Hans Hoppe has written uh, some good things on it, uh, and and David Gord continues to uh, write uh, book reviews uh, in which which he he uh, will usually ad or can address these these types of things. So the science is settled. It's like climate change. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it's settled. It's always economics is an open science because history continues, and 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 there's new complexes of events that come up, as I mentioned, the financial crisis in which we had a, a consumption boom. Uh, 
Uh, so, so it's not the science itself is not closed, but but the method that we use, I think everyone's fairly comfortable with it, applying the pl- praxeological method to developing a theory that will explain these new events. Well, the joke, of course, is that in the physical sciences, something like uh, climate, uh, how, how could the science ever be settled if you accept positivism? As the method, right? You could you could never no, say that, right? I agree. I mean, they're they're they don't have the regularity. I mean, they 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 can't. Uh, a lot of a lot of climate science and other other sciences, like highly uh, theoretical physics, um, the Big Bang theory, mm-hmm. these things really are not scientific in in the sense of being subject to repeatable experiments. I mean, even even the evolutionary hypothesis is just that, a hypothesis. So if we say. Uh, we've tried a million times to put an apple on a branch and it's always fallen to the ground. So that explains gravity or gives us a theory right. of gravity. But there could be the millionth and one and first time and it doesn't fall to the ground and then we're going to have to rethink gravity. Yeah, well, that, that could happen. I mean, that's why the science of human action is actually more certain than, than physics because physics laws are always what they call local laws. We don't know what's going on in another part of the universe. Uh, we can never, we, because we can't trace physical phenomena or natural phenomena back to an X, God or or nature or or the Big Bang theorem uh, theory. Um, so we, we're on much firmer ground. Let's put that that way with praxeology than we are even with physics. Well, Dr. Jessler, this has been a great conversation, very edifying for me. Um, and we're going to again post some links to that particular section in HTML format of Mises' Seminal Human Action, a link to the Murray Rothbard article we mentioned, a link to the Hans Hermann Hoppe book, and also a link to Ludwig von Mises, The Ultimate Foundation of Economic Science. So we hope you enjoyed it, and we will be back soon with an episode based around Ludwig von Mises' great book, Bureaucracy. Thanks so much for listening. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.